square red on the dot. Um, okay, so as the senior ranking member, I am going to call the school committee of July 8th, 2020 to order at 7 p.m. <coughs> Uh, and I will begin with this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, would you please notify the chair, that's myself at the moment, at the start of the meeting. Has anyone on with us plan to record? Hearing none, we will proceed. Um, so this is our first organizational meeting of our new school committee following the town elections. Um, so as I want to thank Dr. Ed Schreier, who served for nine years, and he had been the senior ranking member for many years, and I'm honored to have this um, role of chairing the meeting just until we select a new chair. Um, so I want to formally welcome Michelle Ayer back to our committee for her re-election to a second term, and to welcome Jen Benham to the front of the group as our newest member. She's participated in many of our meetings before, but congratulations on winning your election, Jen. Welcome to the team. We're glad to have you. Um, and so on that note, um, the way we elect officers, it's a self-nominating process. And um, then we vote by roll call vote and uh, majority vote for who will be chair. So on our ballot, um, Carrie Nee has self-nominated for uh, chair. So we will begin with that vote. And as the ballot is there, I will call a roll call vote um, as ranking, senior as the ranking. So um, Carlos, your vote for chair. Carrie Nee. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Carrie Nee. Uh, Carrie? Myself, <laughs> Carrie Nee. <laughs> uh, Libby? Carrie Nee. Okay, Ness? Carrie Nee. Jen Benham? Carrie Nee. Okay, and I myself am in favor of Carrie Nee as well. So. Carrie, congratulations. You are serving as chair for this year coming up. And I'm turning the meeting over to you. <laughs> thank you. So you can do the next two ballots. Great. Yeah, no, thank you, everyone. Um, OK, so the next item is 1.2, which is the election of the vice chair. And Carlos De Silva has self-nominated for that. So we will do the same procedure and go um, go through uh, roll call. And um, so Jen Benham, your vote for vice chair. Carlos De Silva. And uh, Ness Carrenti. Carlos De Silva. And Libby Lewicki. Carlos De Silva. <laughs> and uh, Liza, oh, sorry, Michelle. Uh, Carlos De Silva. And Liza. Carlos De Silva. Um, I am Carlos De Silva as well. I'm Carlos. For Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations, Carlos, and thank you for stepping up. <laughs> thank okay. you so much, everyone. So the next one is 1.3, election of the secretary, and Libby Lewicki has nom self-nominated for that, so we will do the same procedure for that. So um, Jen Benham, your vote for secretary. Uh, Libby Lewicki. Ness. Libby Lewicki. Uh, Libby. Libby Lewicki. <laughs> Michelle. Libby Lewicki. Uh, Liza. Libby Lewicki. Uh, Carlos. Oh, sorry, Libby. <laughs> Are oh, we yeah. here? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yep. uh, Carlos. I'll do me again. 
Can I vote <laughs> twice, Libby? <laughs> Libby. Okay, and I vote for Libby as well. Thank you as well for stepping up. That's, that's great. Thank you. Um, so the next um, order of business is the approval of minutes of the... Oh, before we, before we go, if anyone who's on here, when you're not speaking, could you put yourself on mute um, just so we don't get the feedback? Um, okay, so the next thing is the minutes of the school committee meeting held on June 15th, 2020. Would someone like to make a motion? I'll be glad to make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on June 15, 2020. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, is there any discussion? I have one quick thing, Carrie, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. It's just regarding one thing in the minutes where we were thanking Dr. Ed for his many years of service on, to, on the committee. And I don't think Dr. Ed is on the call, but just in case he is, and just for those listening at home, the facilities department, along with the school committee, we're going to be upon Dr. Schreier, his honorary Hingham Public Schools facility staff shirt. Um, the custodial and facility staff made, had this made for Dr. Ed um, to show their appreciation for all the work that he has done and all that he has contributed particularly to the facilities and um, staff and in the Hingham Public Schools. So thank you, Dr. Ed, if you're listening or seeing this in a recording, I'll drop that off at your house. But that was a really sweet gesture on behalf of um, the facilities folks, and they asked me to pass that along to you. Thank you very much. I'll wear it proudly. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see you on there. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> I had. Okay, so does anyone else have any um, discussion on the minutes? No, hearing none, um, we will vote by roll call um, to accept the minutes of the June 15th, 2020 um, school committee meeting minutes. Um, so, Jen? I will abstain since I was not a member um, oh, okay. in that time. Okay. Um, and Ness Carinti? Aye. Libby Lewicki? Aye. Uh, Michelle Eyre? Sorry, aye. Liza O'Reilly? Aye. And Carlos? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So their minutes are approved. Okay, so the next section is questions and comments. Uh, the Kim Hingham School Committee encourages community in, um, engagement and welcomes questions and comments as agenda items are discussed in the, at the meeting. In addition, we have set aside up to 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting for comments and questions that fall under the purview of the school committee and um, are not already on tonight's agenda. Is anyone, does anyone intend to speak during the public comment period? Okay, um, hearing none, we will move on. Um, item 4.1 is the South Shore Educational Collaborative Update. Dr. Austin, would you like to fill us in on that? Yep, you're on mute. <laughs> That's your first mistake as chair to tell me when I'm on mute. <laughs> uh, you'd be better off if I just had it and people wouldn't have to listen, but. Uh, my comment was, thank you, Chairperson Nee, and, and congratulations on your appointment to the chair. I look forward to working with you in that capacity. You're already doing a great job. Um, so so my first item is the um, South Shore Collaborative, uh, Educational Collaborative Update. Um, so for the last month, we understood the bank balance uh, is still very healthy for South Shore Education Collaborative um, with a $3.1 million uh, balance. Uh, summer enrollment for most programs, except for the community program, is on par with past years. Community enrollment is about 60% of past years, uh, so it's rather understandable in these COVID times. Um, the next union negotiation session is scheduled for Tuesday, July 22nd at 3. Um, they are on track to finish uh, FY20 in the black, um, and they'll close the FY20 books on July 24th. All five um, summer programs are scheduled to open on July 6th, which was obviously this week. Um, they have ordered all the necessary PPEs for next year, some of which they've received already. Uh, the rest is yet to be delivered. Um, same for the cleaning and disinfecting supplies. Uh, and again, thanks for your support uh, to all the, the school committees 
Uh, and please uh, let the school committees know that if they can give any assistance to any of you during the difficult time, they are certainly called upon. So things are in good shape at South Shore Education Collaborative. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone on the committee have any questions for Dr. Austin? Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, does anyone um, in the audience have questions? I'm gonna ask because there are, uh, there are quite a bit of us, if, if you do have questions, please click on participants at the bottom left and um, use the raise hand button, which is at the bottom right of the very right hand side of your screen. So does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, hearing none, we'll move on to 4.2, the Respo Recovery Response Advisory Committee update. Thank you once again, uh, Chair Ruiz and me. Um, the RRAC and the subcommittees uh, continue their work in preparing for the uh, potential opening of schools in the fall. Uh, although we are planning for and hoping to accomplish a full in-person opening, we also need to prepare for a hybrid and fully remote learning uh, platform if necessary. Our plans for reopening are due to the Commissioner of Education uh, in early August, uh, and so we're working on those. Um, we are communicating weekly with the community I realize there are very uh, a lot of unanswered questions that the public wants to know as soon as possible. Uh, I continue to request your patience to ensure that our plan is solid, well, conduct, uh, well constructed, and has input from all of our stakeholders. While our spaces, if organized efficiently, may be large enough to house all students and staff, there will be major work in determining how to use our spaces uh, most effectively and safely. In the coming weeks, the RAC will, conduct, will be conducting a family survey to determine uh, support for a um, full in-person scenario, a hybrid scenario, or remote learning. Um, we still do not have the information on athletics and transportation at this time. I will say, some people have asked me about the survey. Um, we anticipate that that will be uh, published to the community by the 17th. That's the goal right now. We are working on that uh, at this time. Um, and I will also say that even though the uh, commissioner has asked us to present our plans uh, in early August, I think that that's a, uh, a very hefty uh, endeavor um, given the conditions we're under. We are still awaiting um, information and guidance from the commissioner uh, and the governor in regards to um, transportation, in regards to athletics, uh, in regards to uh, PPE and other guidance. Uh, and, and frankly, templates that we'd expected uh, by now to be able to create you know, uh, complete the work. Um, that said, our groups are all working very hard to think of multiple scenarios, um, and we are obviously listening um, to, to our constituents, uh, to our teachers um, who have concerns as well. I mean, I, I think that suffice it to say that there are concerns no matter what direction we go in. Um, and so let's be clear about that, that I don't think there's going to be anything close to a perfect plan that's going to satisfy all the masses. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think that should be our goal. Um, I want to be very clear that our primary goal is to ensure that whatever we do, we do so in the, in the best interest of the health and safety of our staff and students uh, and community, and that we do so also mindful of the um, emotional and social well-being of our students and staff. Uh, and so that has to be paramount in the work we do. So we are working on it. Um, we'll give you information as I can get it to you, but right now we're, we're still in the research and, and design stage, uh, and anything I would give people right now would be strictly speculative, uh, and I don't like the rumor mills going that I'm not sure was going to happen, uh, and so I ask for patience as we continue to make this work happen. But I would also say that <clears throat> we have over 100 people working on this uh, in multiple arenas, and they're working hard. Uh, and they're thinking through the many incredibly high number of um, issues that you have to work through. And as you all know, when we solve one, five others pop up to take its place. Uh, and, and so they're working through those uh, and they're working diligently. Uh, and so we, we will continue that work until we do our best to come up with a plan that meets uh, the needs of our students to the best of our ability. That's it. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone on the committee have a question or a comment? Oh, Michelle? Um, I do just really quickly. Chris Paul, you mentioned that you, you are going to be doing a family survey. And I just want to confirm, are you also doing a um, staff survey? 
we would like to do a staff survey. I hope to do that, and I'll be working with the um, in collaboration with June's on the line up there. I see her shaking her head. Yes, uh, we will be surveying the staff, and we'll do that in collaboration with them. Uh, that's going to be an important part of our information as well. Thank you. Good question. Does anyone else on the committee have a question? Okay, seeing none, does anyone in the audience have a question? And again, if you could just click on participants and the raise hand button at the very bottom right hand, um, if you would have a question or comment. Okay, seeing none, well, we can move on to 4.3, which is facility department report, April through June, 2020. Thank you, Chairperson Me. Um, now, again, that's in your packet, and I don't want to read that. You can read that on your own. Um, but as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of work that, even though that uh, we've been shut down by COVID for a number of months, our facilities department has taken this opportunity to do many of the things that um, we can do while schools are not in session. Um, and so there's, there's quite a list on there um, that they've done. Uh, I thank the facility department um, for their incredible work um, and, uh, and, and as they continue to think about one of the things that we've had to do recently, um, and I really thank uh, Katie Hartman and Doug Foley um, under, under John uh, Ferris's uh, leadership uh, of measuring each classroom in the district uh, and looking at our capacity. Um, across the district for students if we have to do a three, six, three or a six foot um, social distancing or physical distancing. Um, they've been really busy doing those things, so I thank them for that, um, on top of the other things that they do. So they're a phenomenal department, and I appreciate that. But certainly you, you have the, the, uh, all the work that has been done, and I, I don't think I need to read that for you, uh, unless you'd like me to. No, that's great, and I just reiterate the same thing. Thank you to the whole facilities department for all their work during this time. Does anyone else on the committee have a question about the facilities report or comment? I'm not seeing any. Anyone in the audience? Okay, not seeing that. We can move on to uh, item five, which is communications. 5.1 is communications received by the superintendent. Dr. Austin, do you have any? I do not have any report right now. Okay. Um, does anyone else have communications that they wanted to report? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to six, unfinished business. So this item 6.1 is to review section J, which is students of the Hingham Public Schools Policy Manual and act as appropriate. Um, this is a second read. Um, since I'm chair of the policy subcommittee, I can update everyone on this. Um, this is the second read of the section. It covers uh, quite a bit of ground. Um, as with the other sections, we met with uh, our MASC, which is the Massachusetts Association of School Committees field director, and reviewed the MASC sample policies alongside the Hingham Public Schools policies to ensure that we have everything that we need um, legally and then be, to reflect best practice for the district. Um, Dr. Austin participated in, um, in the review of Section J, as, as did Pam King, um, and we, um, this one, this section is important because it mainly, other sections govern kind of the behind the scenes, how our committee works, how the administration works. This one directly impacts students. So it covers um, education, equal educational opportunities, attendance areas, entrance age, homeless students, educational opportunities for military children, educational opportunities for children in foster care, student dress code, bullying prevention, student complaints and grievances, interscholastic athletics, and communicable diseases, among other cat, um, categories. So it's a pretty hefty um, section. Um, in reviewing it, um, Ness was kind enough to pass along one um, update. So policy JBB, um, bullet point one, has a um, list of protected categories and, it's, and um, she pointed out that it's a different list than the one that appears in other aspect or other um, sections of our policy manual. So I was gonna propose one minor change to just take the list that we agreed in for section A and uh, replace that bullet point A, um, sorry, bullet point one with that. So it's just to make it consistent. Um, but so we can either, I'd love to hear what people have to say about these and we can either vote on this tonight or because it is um, such a hefty thing and we I would expect community, the community to, um, to um, have input on it, um, we can also just do a third read. So depending on how people feel, if you're, if you're re well, ready to vote for tonight or not. So does anyone have any comments or questions? 
Libby? Yeah, so um, just looking at the very first paragraph, the very, very first paragraph, um, uh, the, the, the second, there's only two sentences, so the second sentence where it lists um, all of the things for which we will not discriminate against. Um, the very, it says, or, and where I think it should say, and. Um, so a whole long list, and it ends with, or foster care status. Okay. And we should say, and foster care status. Okay. Let's see. And then that would have to be carried throughout wherever this list exists. Yeah, okay. That sounds good if everyone's all right with that. If And if you wouldn't mind making those edits. <laughs> She's... Me? Yep. Okay, <laughs> okay, does anyone else have any comments on any of the policies? Okay, seeing uh, no none, does anyone, uh, how do people feel about voting on this tonight? Would you like to leave it out there in the community? It is on the website. I have sent it to a few people who asked to see it. Um, how, how, how does anyone, everyone feel about voting on it tonight? It is the sec second reading, so I'm comfortable in voting on this tonight. Okay. okay. Uh, Carrie, question. Mm -hmm. uh, for the staff, do you, does the staff feel confident, the administrative staff, that everyone has had time to read through all of this? Jamie, you're shaking your head. Do you want some more time? We would appreciate some more time, please. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, That no, that's important um, because uh, you guys have been super busy and yeah. <laughs> finding this is a long section and it pertains to everything you do every all day long. So, yep, I think that's fine um, to do that. Is that all right with everyone? Yeah, sorry, it's Michelle. I would agree. I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, a new member, the administration needs some time to go through it. Um, I think the public is just starting to digest a lot because this is a lot in here. And yeah, I would agree. Let's postpone. Okay, that sounds good. So we will do that and um, look at this either our next meeting or um, later in the summer. Um, so item 7.1 is to hear an update from the equity task force. I think that's me. Yep. Right? <laughs> Hi everybody, nice to see you. Um, I appreciate you making the time on your agenda to hear from us around our work uh, relative to equity and inclusion. So what I might do is maybe share my screen, um, review some slides with you. The goal is to give you an update of the um, who our group is, what is the work that we've been doing, um, how have we thus far defined uh, educational equity, and then uh, the extent to which we've established our vision uh, for what uh, equity will look like in the Hingham Public Schools, and then tell you a little bit about sort of where we are in progress with our work. Um, so if you bear with me for one second, I'm just going to share my screen um, and pull up um, that presentation for you. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Here we go. Um, so again, this is an update um, on the work of the Equity and Inclusion Working Group uh, that was established uh, last year uh, to begin an open dialogue and to begin uh, a real uh, focus in our professional development work on equity and inclusion um, for our students. So I always begin with the mission. Uh, so again, we feel that the work that we're doing in the Equity and Inclusion Working Group is fully aligned with the uh, mission of the district. So the mission of Hingham Public Schools is, is to provide a challenging and comprehensive educational programs in a safe and supportive environment, enabling all students to develop the knowledge and skills necessary for success as local and global citizens. Um, so we uh, initiated um, at this open, this year's opening convocation back in uh, 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 August, uh, or maybe it was September, I'm drawing a blank, it's been a busy year. Uh, but back when our faculty convened, 
Um, we presented the equity initiative to them um, and sort of talked to them about our work really beginning. And we outlined for them a rigorous plan that would examine our, uh, the design of our academic programs and offerings as well as our academic so uh, selection, um, identify and really do a systematic analysis of our organization to determine if we have any structural issues uh, that are preventing access from uh, four particular groups of kids. Uh, we outlined for them an aggressive agenda to begin to examine our practices, the extent to which we develop and deliver intervention and support systems, the extent to which we have established and continue to foster strong home school partnerships, uh, the extent to which we focus on and celebrate diversity and difference um, in our classrooms and in our school cultures, and as well as the extent to which we um, feel comfortable and really prepared as educators to engage in challenging conversations around uh, equity and inclusion um, that can make some people uncomfortable. Uh, so we have to sort of be uh, cognizant of the realities of sort of asking people to engage in a conversation um, that requires a level of vulnerability uh, with their peers and with students. We also talked to them about uh, really focusing on the examination of our resources. So the extent to which um, we are targeting, recruiting, uh, 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 sort of inducting and then supporting uh, a teaching force of color that, that reflects the population of which they're teaching and the extent to which we have uh, appropriate allocation of resources and source materials that um, give teachers access to materials to engage in some of these more challenging conversations. So that was just to bring you back in time, uh, which was the work that our equity and inclusion task, uh, working group was really tasked with, would be to engage in an examination of design, of practices, and of resources that all sort of come together as one uh, to, to sort of really uh, manifest themselves as the district's focus on equity and inclusion. Now, the purpose of these activities was a roadmap for our future as a district, and that was the development and publication of our district equity and inclusion plan. And you'll note here on the slide that I said was June of 2020. So if I go back to September at opening, the intent was to have actually engaged in a lot of this work by this spring to be able to release publicly our equity and inclusion plan. Um, given the COVID closure uh, of schools, um, the district administration sort of redeployment of resources and focus onto our remote learning models uh, and then cl uh, closing out the year and now really being focused on opening plans. Um, our goal is uh, to still uh, create and release a district-wide equity and inclusion plan that sort of outlines for the community uh, the work that we're doing and sort of the tasks that need to get completed in order for our vision and mission to become a reality. Um, we have, we're just thoughtful at this stage um, in terms of when that plan will get released. Again, the initial date was this June to have it released last month. Um, given the reality of our spring, uh, we are still hoping to publish it. Um, we're not sure when that's gonna happen. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about why our work is, is sort of is continuing to involve, evolve um, into the spring and into the summer uh, to ensure that this remains a priority for the district. Um, so I'll circle back to this in a minute, but I just, I didn't want the community to know and the public to know that when we opened in September, right, the goal was to have a published plan ready, having done our deep dive of the structural issues in or for this June. And that timeline has been delayed. I'm not sure when we're going to release it again, but um, it will come in time. Um, so I want to uh, introduce to you, and, and some of them may be on the call. Um, so maybe when there's questions or at the end of the presentation, we can allow them to jump in and talk a little bit about their experiences so far. So the Equity and Inclusion Working Group is, is um, I've given you sort of a sense of membership across the different levels. Uh, so at the elementary level, we, have, um, we are joined by Mary Eastwood by Heather Anderson, Laura Samarov, Lori Lucas, Carolyn Bixby, and Susan Willison. At the middle school, we have Jenna Nelson and Melissa Goldman. At the high school, we have Colin Shattuck, who we will be removing from our list slightly because he has moved on to new adventures in his professional career. But we are still lucky enough to work with Rose Bakuga, Kara Roth, Courtney Bruno, and Gus Haflin. And at the district level, um, is, uh, I am the chair of the working group, and we also have uh, representation from student services with Dr. Venice, uh, Erica Pollard, our director of world languages, and Carol Perez, our, our MET co-director. Um, so we, um, the initial work began in the fall uh, to really introduce the, to the faculty 
the idea of equity, be, equity and inclusion being a, a real focus of our professional development program. The team and, and, and be all then began working on, before we can really develop our plan and sort of roll out um, action plans and, and sort of steps to complete, we need to first figure out what it is we're working for. So the first major task and the completed task of the um, uh, equity and inclusion working group was to first define educational equity. And so this is the district's definition. When we set, talk about educational equity, we are talking about the shared responsibility that all members in our school community have to address the opportunity gaps that exist within our society and impact our students' ability to reach their full potential. Um, it is deliberately broad, it is deliberately vague, it is deliberate in that the, uh, the experiences of students of color and uh, black and indigenous peoples in our schools can vary so widely that really what we, what we identified was sort of the presence of opportunity gaps and where we have the ability as an organization uh, to take steps to consciously address these opportunity gaps that exist for our students and um, in some instances for some of our faculty. Um, the ultimate goal was to, we have sort of this vision of what will this will look like when it's up and running and fully a part of who we are and what we do as a district. And that is, uh, regardless, our vision of equity is that regardless of student background, experience, and knowledge, uh, our students will be provided with opportunities and resources to develop socially, emotionally, and academically in a safe, supportive, enriching, and bias-free environment. And that really is when we talk about if we are to um, meet our, sort of actualize what our vision of equity is, this is what it would look like every day in our classrooms that our kids are uh, developed regardless of background experience or background knowledge, all students are provided opportunities and resources to develop um, in a bias-free, safe and enriching environment. And that's our ultimate goal for the student experience. Um, so what we've done so far, so we have so far defined educational equity for the district, which, um, you know, we have a beautiful slide now with some sentences, but I will tell you the process to arrive there was laborious and long and involved a lot of nuanced discussion of language uh, selection and, and word choice. Uh, we also then define the district's equity, a vision for equity in the district. Um, we actually have a pretty comprehensive resource document that we're still continuing to add to to provide resources and materials and supports to our faculty in our community when we actually launch our equity initiative. Um, and we've also completed at the leadership team level sort of an organizational analysis. So as we begin this work and as we think about rolling out this program, we need to first be really cognizant of the community and of the organization in which we all work and live. And so we conducted what was what's referred to as a SWOT analysis, where prior to our really getting into our work, we sit and talk about the organization's strengths, its weaknesses, where the opportunities to engage in this work lie, and where the threats to our mission and the threats to our vision uh, can really derail us. Um, and so after the leadership team completed that exercise as the, the, the leaders of the district, we then presented, presented it to our faculty. So there are also a number of tasks that are underway that are being overseen by the Equity and Inclusion Working Group. The first one uh, is a series of summer work groups, which I'll talk about um, in just a few minutes and give you some titles and sort of who's working on that. Um, on March 3rd, which was the, the primary election day, we actually had no school, but we did hold a district-wide professional development day. On that day, uh, the faculty once again heard from me about our equity initiative. Um, we presented to them our definition and our vision of, of equity in the district. And then they heard uh, their first keynote address by Mr. Johnny Cole, who was the Director of Equity and Inclusion and Student Supports for the Lexington Public Schools, who actually came and gave a session uh, to our educators on implicit bias understanding what it is, understanding how it can impact your decision making, um, and really uh, encouraging in our educators to sort of really begin to question and be thoughtful of their own bias and, and assumptions in teaching and learning. The faculty, after hearing Mr. Cole's keynote, then broke out into grade level and department specific groups where they themselves, as our educators, also completed a SWOT analysis again, to better inform our working group on where 
the strengths are to begin this work, where our weaknesses and where our structural or our places where we have to sort of either uh, allocate more resources or be, be more thoughtful as we start the conversation, where the real opportunities are and where our threats were. So that analysis is actually currently underway. So if you go back in time, March 3rd is the PD day, um, and that was our morning was a focus on equity. The faculty broke out, had their small group discussions, submitted their responses, and the next week um, we shut down for COVID. So um, about uh, two or three weeks ago, the team sort of met again, and I will, I'm pleased to report that Boris Samarov is in the process of leading the equity team through that uh, deeper dive of the data and identifying common themes or trends that we found from that qualitative uh, SWOT analysis that we asked our faculty to do. Again, to better inform the rollout of our actual equity and inclusion plan. Um, we also have underway right now under the leadership of Lori Lucas, who's one, again, one of the members of our equity and inclusion team. She's actually leading a group over the summer um, to focus on ensuring that classroom libraries that, that exist in our teachers' classrooms um, uh, represent stories and narratives from a variety of backgrounds and cultures to ensure our kids have access to common uh, materials uh, that ensure uh, many narratives and many kids of color and different points of view and backgrounds and family systems and family structures are all represented. Um, we also have, um, as our departments sort of begin uh, working on reviewing curriculum scope and sequence, uh, for example, sophomore English right now is looking at a equity audit of the sophomore program. And in discussions with Mary Andrews, our director of English language arts and drama, I, I, she wanted me to really sort of be sure that I stressed with the committee the fact that this isn't being done because of the ongoing narrative in, in the, in the, in, on the national front and in the state local level around um, equity and inclusion and racism, but this is part of what we do on a regular basis, right? So, so what they, she, her sophomore group happens to be up this summer um, doing that audit, but they wanted, she wanted me to be, to just make sure that I was clear that every time they engage in this kind of curriculum work, they do look for diverse perspectives and equity is a part of that lens that they use when doing that work. Now, that's to say, um, this is where we were as of early March. Here are some tasks that are currently underway, but we do have some more work to do before we can actually roll out the full equity and inclusion plan. The first is the formulation. So once we have the data um, coming out of our sort of district-wide analysis, we want to begin to formulate strategies and action steps that will begin to move the district toward actualizing that vision of equity that we just outlined on a, a, a few slides ago. Um, that's gonna begin with the development of the district's PD program, um, focus on equitable outcomes. That could be through workshops, conferences, and graduate classes. Um, as, you, as many of you know, I'm um, also a part-time uh, evening instructor at, the, at Boston University, um, which just uh, established the Center for uh, um, uh, Research into Racism. Um, and so we've got some resources at the university that we'll be tapping into as they also begin to sort of better look at and research this work. Um, we also want to be thoughtful about identifying what those metrics for success will be or what, the, what, a, what key accomplishments do we want to see and along what timeline. Right, so it's all good and well to have this wonderful plan, but if we, if we come back in a year, um, how do we, how are we accountable to the public, to our community, to ensure that the work that we have, uh, that we are outlining to do, the work that we are endeavoring to undertake, actually is making a difference in the lives of kids and in our, in the, in the ability to teach and learn for our faculty. So we are going to be working with that working group to identify the metrics for success and the key accomplishments that we want to see, and then the timeline around which we want to see those metrics and those accomplishments. Um, so again, while we have done a lot of work, we've got a, a fair amount of things underway, there's still much to be completed, and I don't want anyone to leave with the impression that it's all, they're all set, they're on it. It's actually a work in progress, um, and the, the most recent national conversation has actually propelled this work to the forefront, but just to be really uh, clear with the community and with the committee, this work in Hingham was really underway at least two years ago, at least in a planning phase, right? So we have been working on how do we go here? How do we get here? And that national conversation has really opened the door for us to have that conversation more publicly. 
Um, and so this just gives you a sense of what uh, the questions were that we asked the faculty and the leadership team to really be thoughtful of in terms of our strengths. So what do we do well? What unique talents or knowledge or resources do we have? What would other people say we do well? What resources do we have? What's our greatest achievements? Weaknesses, where can we improve? What, what are we lacking? What disadvantages do we have? We have a lot of advantages, but at the same time, we have to be thoughtful about where we can um, identify areas for further development and, and resource allocation. What are things that people say that we don't do well, right? I mean, so we have to be open and, and sort of uh, uh, be active listeners to people even when they bring critical feedback. Um, that they often, we may not agree sometimes, but, but that feedback inside of that actually has some really important information for us to be thoughtful of as we advance the conversation. In terms of opportunity and also, you know, where do we need more training? Where can we support our teachers and our community in having these conversations in sustained ways? So they're not one off experiences at professional development sessions. Um, in terms of opportunities, you know, how can we turn our weakness, our strengths into opportunities and likewise our weaknesses? Is there some need in the community that no one is meeting that this work can actually meet? Or is the, what could we do today that isn't being done to actually make this work go a little bit smoother? And in terms of threats, it was really around where the obstacles we're fake, uh, facing relative to the conversation. Could any of our weaknesses actually prevent us from meeting our goal, right? We have to be thoughtful organizationally that, you know, if we have this challenge here, that challenge, if not addressed, could actually uh, be a threat to the implementation of our vision in the long run. Um, who and or who and or what might cause the problems in the future and how can we be thoughtful of those and how can those problems emerge and are there any changes in our field or in technology that could actually threaten our success. And we've actually been talking as our team a little bit about sort of the current narrative in social media of, of shaming and so we want to be sort of thoughtful that um, we provide a space for everybody to sort of come into it in an open, honest way that, um, of, that evokes um, sort of a, a narrative around improvement and change and betterment, right, for really for our students and our, our, the kids of Hingham, more so than any personal agendas or personal uh, points of view. So we want to be thoughtful that we approach it as educators, right, that we uh, sort of help our students develop the key, the, the strategies and skills around thinking critically about it um, in order for them to form their own opinions based on fact and on information. And with that, um, I will, I think, uh, I'm, uh, at this point, I'll sort of pause for any discussion or feedback or questions. Uh, but I hope that that presentation gave you all a better sense of the work that's been, uh, been done, what we have currently underway and sort of what still lies um, on the road ahead in order to bring our vision of equity to become a reality. Thank you, Jamie, that was, that was great. Um, does anyone on the committee have questions? <coughs> uh, Michelle? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this, I appreciate it. Um, I was thinking about this a lot over the past couple of days and um, appreciate the work that's being done here because I don't think we can reiterate enough just how important this work is. Um, I think, and we, we probably all agree, so I may be preaching to the choir a bit, but I think it bears repeating. Um, I think, we, you know, we've been quiet for too long. Discrimination, bias, bullying, ridiculing. There are serious issues that face not only the country, but sadly our schools. And we just can't tolerate it. Not, not here, right? Not anywhere. And I think we feel even at the Hingham Public Schools, the culture is changing and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be uncomfortable and not everyone's going to like the changes that are made, but we all know that we can't hide behind traditions and intentions, right? We can't make excuses. We have to hold ourselves and each other accountable even when holding people accountable isn't maybe the most popular thing to do. Because I think that there are young men and women who are in their most formative years and they're in the care of the Hingham Public Schools and they have to know that they're protected, they have to know that they are valued, they have to know they have a voice, they have a right to speak up and shame on us as adults or educators if we don't listen to them and stand up for them. I think every person in this district who interacts with or makes decisions on behalf of students has to be held to a standard of care that is beyond 
reproach. It's a bar that has been set for him in public schools, and it's not a bar that can be measured by AP scores or how many wins there were on the field or in the court. It's gonna be measured by the spirit of self-worth that our students developed under the care of the Hingham Public Schools. That is one of the key par parts of the Hingham Public School mission and our students deserve it and we have to be the ones to deliver it for them. Um, you know, today I took my oath of office again for the school committee and it struck me that that's what I signed up to do and that's what I you know, promised to do, that I would uphold the office of the school committee, which is to uphold the mission of public schools. And I apologize because this will be a soapbox that I will be on a lot this year. Um, and, and again, because I know how much good work is being done in the district by administrators and by our staff. And I appreciate it. And I just want to keep encouraging the great work that's getting done. Um, so I do really appreciate everything that's being done. Um, so I did have actually a couple of Direct questions, actually, Jamie, if you don't mind, because I love the idea of the um, book groups that are going. So I wondered, could you like tell us some of the titles that are being read? So maybe some school committee members or parents could read them also. Yeah. So we have uh, quite a few different titles going. So we have The Person You Mean to Be uh, by Dolly Q, uh, mm -hmm. White Fragility, um, Stamped Racism, Anti Racism, and You uh, by Eber Max Kendi and Jason Reynolds. Um, so you want to talk about race. We have I'm Still Here, uh, Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness uh, by Austin Changing Brown. And then we have Beyond the World in Me uh, by Tanisha uh, Coates. Um, so those are just uh, a, a few of the topics. They were interest-based. So um, one of the things we put to the equity team was if anyone is interested, the district, uh, while we are uh, sort of moving into budget austerity measures heading into fiscal 21, um, we did set aside some professional development funds to ensure that we could continue to support the professional development needs of our faculty. Um, and one of those needs is allocating resources. For example, we're purchasing the books where we can, or we are providing reimbursement for books that are purchased as a part of this reading program. Um, and the discussions that will come out of the summer are all being either facilitated or led uh, by a member of the equity and inclusion team. Um, so we have certain books that are being read at certain schools for their faculty. We have other books that are being read that are open to all faculty that could join uh, the high school in and of themselves. Um, and I know Kara's on the call, so I don't want to take, I want to be really ca uh, careful to say that Kara Roth is one of the members of our equity inclusion team and actually spearheaded the organization of the high school book groups. They've got four book groups running just at the high school. Um, so I want to publicly acknowledge Kara and her work on that. And Kara, if you wanted to say a few words about the high school book groups, I, I'm sure the committee would be appreciative of any insight you had. Um, yeah, no insight as of yet. I'm, other than, well, I can say um, we had a really positive turnout. None, the first one takes place next week. And there's one each week until, uh, I think, the first week of August. Yeah. Um, so there was uh, multiple people have signed up for multiple book groups. Um, and a lot of people have already been in book groups previously run um, by like Chrissy O'Connor has run book groups in the past for So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Luo. Um, but like some people have signed up again and people who couldn't make the first one have signed up. So um, I don't want to say numbers off the top of my head, but I, multiple dozen, multiple dozens of people have signed up. Um, so again, some for, mul uh, for multiple book groups. Um, and that's great. Um, I know it's obviously all voluntary in the summer and um, yeah, the four group, the four, I think you said the four titles and then um, it, like I said, the white fragility um, starts next week. Um, and then after that it is stamped. And then, so you want to talk about race and then, no, sorry. And then I'm still here. And then, so you want to talk about race. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'm happy to, I'll, you know, certainly be sending you a report, Jamie and people I think have been contacting your office to order the books. Yep. Yeah, and my new assistant, Gabby, who's wonderful and on board, and we're so happy to have a support in the office, is actually facilitating the ordering for, or the reimbursement process, depending on which, where people were. Some of the books now, where there is such a sort of a, a bigger conversation happening, are totally sold out. So we could, we had a hard time even purchasing them to order for the faculty. So in some instances, they're getting themselves and being reimbursed the cost, 
other cases we're able to purchase the whole title, particularly those that start a little bit later or actually get a bit of a head start. And I also want to highlight one of the things that Kara said, which was just a reminder that that this was a voluntary opportunity for our faculty and um, the interest really has been stellar, right? So, so um, this is, they're doing, they're not being compensated, they're giving, they're being given professional development points, right? But this is of their own time in order to truly make them better educators, engage in, in really rich discourse with their peers around common issues and experiences they're facing. And I wanna, just so that the community and the committee understand that this is really a benefit and a, uh, a real show of the level of commitment of our teachers, right, to this topic that they are giving up their summer vacation after what, by all accounts, has been a challenging spring uh, to close out the school year to sort of step back into that Zoom experience and engage with each other around really important topics. So I can't say enough about how wonderful the faculty has been, about the energy and enthusiasm of the equity and inclusion team, um, and really um, have taken this and really run. I'm just there sort of giving structure and asking questions and making sure we're following the process, and they are really taking it and really running with it. So um, thanks again, Kara, for, 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 for mentioning that, but I mean, you can see the quality of people we have involved across multiple levels in schools. In schools. Um, it's really phenomenal, and we're excited to share with you as this unfolds the work that will continue to be ongoing uh, throughout the year. Yeah, great, and I thank think you. It's great that, um, it, uh, we're doing the ones at the high school because particularly a lot of the discussions when you um, are talking about the implications for the reading, um, how it affects you know, your day-to-day -day work with the kids, those discussions can be so different um, from K through 12. So that we wanted to kind of, at least you know, for the high school ones, focus on what this means for kids at this age level. Um, and of course, it's even, it'll be wonderful going forward to have even more of those conversations during the school year with multiple disciplines and multiple disciplinary groups together because the more different perspectives we have in those groups the better so um that'd be awesome thanks jamie and thanks for getting thank involved. you Kara. thank you thank you that's great uh libby did you have a question yeah carrie thank you uh, i was just wondering if a person ever wanted to could they participate in any of those book groups and um, just uh you know, for my own education and or would that be intrusive So I'm sorry. The question was whether the, the if committee wanted to, if they could engage in the book groups as well. Yeah, yeah. for our own, for my own, speaking for myself, for my own edification. Sure. Um, if I could maybe think about that more and then get back to you, the only reason I'm pausing is I want to be really thoughtful that we give our faculty a safe space where they can sort of feel free to have conversations. And, and I, you know, it may be a really great opportunity actually for some of them to get to, get to know some of you, right, relative to as well as the committee. But I also don't want to have a situation where anyone's made to be like, oh my God, the school committee's here with me, right? So I just want to maybe talk that out a little bit more with Paul and get his thoughts and sort of maybe get back, circle back to the committee. Or we could also offer another opportunity for community and parents, right? That the committee might take more of a leadership role in maybe running some book groups for us, right? In terms of having those conversations with other parents, that might be a really great effective use of your role but also your influence and connections in the community to actually bring people together to have that conversation that then supports the work that our teachers are doing i don't want to say no i just want to think about it more so we can be thoughtful of logistics no that makes that makes sense and and libby i would just um say you might want to look into the ham unity council um they're having a, a discussion with Dog, dolly chug who wrote the person you mean to be um, tomorrow night. And then they're also doing a book group on stamps later on. So they're covering a lot of the same topics. So that might be worth looking into too. Yeah, their stamp, the Hingham Unity Council's discussion on stamp, I believe is one or two days after the Hingham High School teachers. So that's a nice- We could do it in, yeah, in conjunction with that. Yeah. Liza, did you- uh, Yeah, so I, I appreciate you doing the SWOT analysis and, and admitting that there may be difficult conversations. Have you considered trying to get input from students or maybe parents about some of their experiences that the staff may have absolutely no idea have occurred? Mm -hmm. And so that then we can begin to be more aware of it or start addressing it. Um, 
So that that was I, I appreciate everything you've done covering yeah. all the staff, but then sometimes you know the other people in the building experience things that maybe you don't you just have no idea is happening. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think you um, really highlight an excellent point. And just to be clear, there had been some discussion of holding focus groups um, mm -hmm. to begin to have these conversations with community members, parents, and with uh, uh, our students. We also have a good relationship with our local clergy. I've met with them a couple different times about different initiatives to sort of get their take on things. We really do view it as a community-based initiative. Um, and so what I will say is the very first conversation we had with the faculty was on March 3rd, right? So yeah. in terms oh, of yeah, yeah. Planning, the goal going into next year though is to sort of circle back um, and to get feedback. I, if I could just sort of maybe uh, be vulnerable for a second, if we go back a couple years, where this first gets on my radar is when a group of students of color approached mm -hmm. us as administrators and talked to us about their experiences uh, mm -hmm. being black in our classrooms. Yeah. That was eye opening to me, right? In yeah. my role as their assistant superintendent. So this so this that, goes that's back, also in yeah, my mind. This of, goes yeah. back a couple yeah. years ago. What yeah. the, when uh, Dr. Venice, who's on the call with me, when she first arrives uh, almost two years ago now, three years ago now, um, was one of our very first conversations, right? Was around the yeah, completing year two, heading into year three, right? So yeah. when she first <laughs> here, we actually started talking about how do we do this in a way that doesn't, that addresses the need that, but also doesn't turn some people off from the conversation. Cause that not right. the last thing we want is people to walk away saying, well, this is ridiculous. It's not yeah. actually, right? We need everybody's input. Um, and so as the initiative kicks off in the fall and the work began, we had sort of a longer view to do actually do a SWOT analysis with community members, SWOT analysis with parents, SWOT analysis, right, with our students. Like, so what do we do well? What do we not do well? Where do we have opportunities? And, you know, kids know um, other avenues or sort of ways that they communicate that we may not even be aware of. So to answer your question in a very long-winded way, sorry, but the goal is, yes, to actually involve okay. multiple stakeholders in the conversation. Um, but it was just in terms of timing, literally yeah. the very first conversation with the faculty was literally the week before our right. shutdown. And then it sort of just put us on a bit of a trajectory that really wasn't ideal, um, but yeah. that will pick up in earnest, in earnest once we're sort of back and um, to a, a bit of normalcy with the school year. Great, That's thank great you. Question. I appreciate it. Okay, um, Michelle, did you have something else? Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to um, pivot a little bit on Liza's comment and Jamie to your point on that, because I do think that we are, we all acknowledge, right, the burden on the public schools is already pretty heavy, right? So I don't want it to, I, I think the community needs to own this as well and do a lot of work ourselves, um, just like the teachers are doing on their own time over the summer, right? So it, it, this has to be sort of a community-wide effort. So I liked that Carrie um, reminded folks about the Hing Immunity Council and some of the work that they are doing. Um, some of us on the committee are also on that group for full disclosure, um, but it is important because, right, the, the schools can't reach everyone, right, and they can't do the work in a, in a silo, right? If it's, if it's only being done at school and it's only being done to teachers, it's, it's not enough, right? So if we agree as a, as a community that this is, these are issues that need to be addressed, um, the, it, it needs to be a community-wide effort. So I think that Hing Immunity Council, combined with what the schools are doing, combined with what clergy doing, I think we're at a really great um, moment here that we could really start affecting some great change. So thank everyone, um, particularly the faculty and staff who are doing so much work on this effort, um, in addition to everything else that you're going through right now. And I will say just as a final wrap up point is we are also working to build con consultative partnerships with experts in this field, right? So I have to be totally honest that while this was a part of my training, it's really not a specialty of mine, right? To sort of engage in these conversations. So we are partnering with uh, professors from BU. We got people from Harvard. We're sort of working with a variety of people who sort of, this is what they do to sort of better inform. And that's where our partnership, it actually initiates over a year ago with METCO, 
where the direct the METCO director of equity inclusion and I don't know if Carol's on the call but she remembers this was actually supposed to be our consultants METCO had some organizational changes and that person we were partnering with no longer works there so then we literally had to go back to square one to find a new partner which is where they actually connect us with Johnny Cole from Lexington so we had been all along and and my experience is in background in Boston Suzanne's uh, background experiences in Brookline sort of we had been talking about how other places had done the work and what worked well from our experiences worth what didn't go well so that when we did implement in Hingham it was done thoughtfully it was done um, sort of with a research base that supports the efficacy of the implementation and also has good outcomes in the end for everybody involved so um, I don't want anyone to feel like the work is happening sort of willy-nilly or we're sort of running into this we have been uh, sort of two years literally in the planning of getting this far in the conversation so we're very excited to continue that work um, we understand it's a priority for the community and for the committee and um, we assure you that it's one of our uh, priorities as well great thank you um, does anyone in the audience have any questions or comments about this presentation if you could again just use the raise hand button so click on participants and on the bottom right hand corner, there's raise hand. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So I just want to thank you again for everyone who's engaging in this work. Um, it really benefits every Hingham student as we improve in this area um, because the world doesn't look like Hingham and it gives it the, or it's going to give all of our students just more tools and more vocabulary to go and have these important conversations as they move on. So just thank you again to everyone who's engaging in this. Um, so next is um, item 7.2, to hear a recommendation on the fiscal year 21 per diem and hourly rate schedule and act as appropriate. Thank you, um, Chairperson Ani. I'll turn that over to, um, I think we can go to John first or are we gonna go to uh, Liza? You wanna go to John first, Liza? Yeah, all right, John Ferris. Give us some background on this, please. Hope you're not with me, John. John, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Is that better? Okay, I'm sorry about that. It's like every, every time you switch over, there's a new configuration for something. So I had it in the office, so I was using the system in the office because I don't need the headset, but I had to switch over. Sorry about that. Um, so the um, per diem rate schedule is a, is a rate schedule. There's a, a number of um, rates that we have um, that annually, they don't fit in any bargaining unit. And, um, you know, so we have a, a schedule of those rates. They include st stuff like student workers that we may hire over the year, tutors, bus driver subs, substitutes, and, and, and the sort. So um, on an annual basis, typically what we do is, um, you know, we'll update that schedule and we um, past several years, we've updated the schedule and provided a 2% increase to uh, many of the rates. Um, the, um, and, and so what we've done this year too, once again, is I took those same rates and I, I could flash this up on the uh, board. If, um, am I allowed to share? My yeah, you should, you should have screen share. Should be fine. Okay, good. So let me um, share my screen and Oop. Host disabled share screening. Um, oh, uh, is it, uh, is it possible I can? Yeah, try now, John. You should be okay. Okay, so um, I believe this is the schedule here. So let's see, how's that? Is that coming through for everybody? So um, as you can see, so these are, these are the rates we have job, um, student help, teacher workshop rate. Um, tutor, English language learners, tutors, drivers. Um, and these would all be rates that aren't in any other contract. So if there's another contract that supersedes this, that other contract would, would be what we would be honoring, um, not this rate schedule. But like subs aren't really typically incorporated into these contracts. So we, we have um, sub rates. Um, up here, what I've done is on this spreadsheet basically is put a 2% increase to uh, most of the rates. Some rates I haven't because um, in discussing with the um, you know, with the supervisor like dispatch like in van um, driver sub rate kept at $19. A monitor I kept at the 1465 
um, simply for the level of work and the ability of getting workers there. Um, you know, 1465 for riding around on a van sounds pretty good. Um, and, and $19, like our rates are very competitive for van um, drivers. So, you know, we kept some rates the same versus big, big uh, bus drivers, you know, are a different story. They're more, much more difficult to get. Um, over this past several years, we've had some issues getting teachers um, subs. And um, so what, what you notice here in the yellow is we've gone um, and discussed a, a way of increasing the teacher subs to, to basically reflect the, you know, uh, um, the, the minimum wage increases that have taken place over the past, um, you know, several years and try to, to keep the ability to get subs uh, competitive with, uh, with the minimum wage. So um, in discussing with the committee, we've increased that um, by $8 um, for the um, subs that are over 10 days. And that's cumulative. So it's not, and it's not on an annual basis. So once a sub is with us, we have many um, subs that have been with us with, you know, several years, uh, many years. And so once they do 10 days with us, they're at that higher rate forever, um, so long as they stay with us. And this, um, the, the $90 rate there is for new subs. Nurses, several years ago, we increased that rate because of the difficulty of getting those subs. Um, Long-term um, uh, teacher assignments that's based on, um, one one eighty fifth of the B one rate, and that reflects the uh, the new um, MOA and contract that we'll be entering with the um, with the teachers. Two to subs, uh, you know, kind of similar with the um, with uh, the um, nurse subs. Sometimes the you know if you had a tutor, they don't always work a full day, so we have sort of a, a rate. But if they do work a full day, they're um, we, we set a rate there so that we got a day rate and then we'd sort of divide that by hours if it's just for a couple of hours because sometimes a tutor will step in for a teacher and, and do significant work over a period of time. Um, then we have uh, teaching assistants that this is para rates of 1436. If they're over 30 days, if they make a commitment for over 30 days, we pay them a, a higher rate. Um, this is, um, extended school year. So summer teachers at 1644. Um, bus and van monitor regular assignment rate of 1612. Um, that's for, uh, you know, for regular assignment um, rates. And, and that would be for someone that's doing just that work. So they're hired just for that work. We do have um, monitors that are our regular employees. So it would be our bus driver employees. Um, you know, lots of times the van drivers, if they want some extra money, they'll take um, some um, van, uh, you know, monitor type routes uh, along with a bus driver, a driver. And if that would happen, they would end up getting the rate that's um, uh, appropriate to the number of years of service they have on the para contract scale. Um, <clears throat> the driver education coordinator that's been increased by 2% faculty manager. And then we have the summer schools. Okay, so summer teachers, those uh, rates here are up by 2%. And um, custodian subs, we have kids in action. The, the sub rate for kids in action was set uh, a few years ago. We think it's still a good rate. There's a full day rate and there's a half day rate. And, um, and then if we were to enter into some type of contract with them that it's like greater for than 30 days, if they have a real longer term assignment, we'd sort of look at that on, um, on a case by case basis. And then we have guidelines set up for uh, kids in action um, and you know, some for uh, kids in action over 24 hours and kids in action under 24 hours. Those are increased by 2% uh, as recommended here. And um, technology assistance by 2% um, and tutors, literacy and math tutors that we have operating within the schools at 2%. And we have athletic trainer. Um, that's, we've always had the athletic trainer. It's uh, Al Boisdell. He has um, been the trainer for years. He owns his own company. So really, this is really a, uh, the payment is, uh, is made to his company. Um, so this, uh, what it does is it updates the rates to reflect uh, you know, what it, uh, a 2% increase in by and large um, for um, FY21. And we did discuss it with um, salary negotiations, and I'm sure Eliza and, um, you know, if you'd like to say anything. 
Uh, yeah, so we we reviewed this with John. I can say one thing we were very careful about, especially with the substitute rates, to make sure that the um, it fell within the con the union contract. So, for example, if a there's a rate in the contract for the paras, if a para serves as a um, classroom teacher or substitute. Um, this daily rate for an outside person falls below that. Um, so we were careful in making sure that the, um, the raises were equitable, but then fair to all staff. And, you know, with teacher subs, that's really the one area that we had the greatest increase, but we have a real difficulty in getting people. And so we felt that it had been a long time since we had made an increase in that rate and it was time to see if that would help in getting more people to come forward for that role. Um, and hopefully we will need them in the classroom next school year. <laughs> uh, hoping that that happens. Um, just one thing I just noticed with the athletic trainer, I hadn't noticed that before, but John, maybe um, we should work out something for this coming year um, paying it on a season to season basis for uh, installment basis, depending on what happens with the amount of activity that he actually engages in. Um, yeah, that's a good point, Eliza. We we do we always do pay um, on a seasonal basis. I mean, that's split up typically uh, into four payments. And you know, I really haven't touched base with uh, Al um, this year, so we will certainly have to talk about um, you know that amount for next year, depending on how athletics goes. So, you know, I I would agree with that a hundred percent. And it, it would be a contract with a company. So you know, and and I think that we'd be discussing that with him. Um, you know, to, yeah, we, we shouldn't be paying the full rate if we're not doing a full year service. And I think he'd be completely understanding about that. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you, John. Um, and thank you, Liza, too, for your input. Does anyone else have um, any questions or comments about this on the committee? Um, okay, um, and sorry, I can't see everyone because of the screen um, sharing. Do you want me to stop sharing? And then I could um, share again if you want me to put yeah, it up be, again, okay? Yeah, it'd be great, okay. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? No, okay, anyone in listening have any questions or comments? No, okay, um, so you're looking to vote, we're, you're looking for a vote on this tonight, is that correct, John? Yes, please, yes, approval of the schedule. Okay. Okay, I can make a motion. Okay. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the recommendation on the fiscal year 21 per diem and hourly rate schedule as presented to us by right. the director of business services. Great. Do I have a second? I'll second. Oh, thanks, Ness. Okay. And we will do a roll call vote on uh, Jen Benham. Aye. <laughs> Ness Parenti. Aye. Libby Lewicki. Aye. Uh, Michelle Ayer. Aye. Uh, Liza O'Reilly? Aye. Carlos De Silva? Aye. And I'm an I as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank That's you. Great. Okay, next one, 7.3, to receive an update on the status of reimbursements for COVID-19 expenses from the county commissioner. Dr. Austin, do you want to? Yeah, I'll start that real quick. Um, just to, and, I, and I'm very cognizant. I know we have a long agenda. We have many things to do tonight, so I'll try to move quickly on that. Um, but uh, we'll certainly let you know our, our reimbursements, um, uh, where we're at right now uh, from the Plymouth County Commissioners. It's important to note, and, and, I, and I want you all to note that um, many people have been discussing this $225 per pupil that the governor and commissioner had mentioned. Um, in regards to uh, district aid uh, to, to uh, address the issues of, of COVID-19. Um, that said, um, districts in Plymouth County uh, and Boston are not eligible to, uh, to uh, have that reimbursement. Um, so we really do count on these Plymouth County uh, funds. Um, so I would also tell you that um, 
what we know as far as what is available to the town right now. And I say town because this is not school specific. It's for the town of Hingham. Um, right now through phase one and phase two of what's available is approximately $1.5 million uh, in total. Um, and, and how that's distributed between the town and the school is, is really um, to be yet determined or yet to be determined. Uh, to, to date, um, we're, we are uh, ordered the um, laptops we said we would order, um, which is a little over $300,000. Um, that was for, to ensure that our teachers had uh, appropriate technology in case we have to do remote learning uh, in the fall. Um, we were talking about potentially ordering um, some Chromebooks as well, but it's also our understanding that Chromebooks are backed up probably until um, December. Um, before we could any, get any new Chromebooks right now, which is going to be problematic, um, for sure. Um, not just for our district, for, for many districts. Um, and so um, those are some of the things that we'll be looking to, to use this money for. In addition to that, we also we do have cleaning. Um, we have PPEs on order. Um, we have some of the, uh, I, I'm going to mess it up, the name, electrostatic guns or uh, disinfecting guns that we're using. Uh, it's probably the wrong name, Don. You'll, you'll correct me nope, what I got that's wrong. That's good. Victory guns. That's Close correct. enough? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so all those things are what we plan to put in. Uh, but, John, do you want anything to that? Um, yeah, I would just say, so we, um, you know, it, for expenses for this year so far, I mean, you know, we're, we're compiling those because there was a filing coming up and we hope to uh, get the, the invoices up to the, um, the uh, town accountant, Sue, so she can kind of file on the July 10th filing. Um, you know, to file for the reimbursement, you actually have to have paid the invoice off already, and then you have to have the check number as well. So there's a there's a um, a process to it, and you know, typically we we, we you know we, we're what four months into this now. Um, you know, the expenses in in your packet there, I did attach sort of like three sheets so that you can kind of see you know what the deal with the Plymouth County uh, money is and what type of expenses would be required and sort of the schedule that you have to submit when you submit for reimbursements. We've got about $66,000 of ancillary stuff that we've um, purchased and, and that would include um, you know some payroll for some TV development for online learning, um, some PPE that we purchased, some cleaning supplies, some overtime we did, you know, say from March 1st until we shut down and um, until a closure really in uh, March 13th when we were disinfecting every single night in every room. So we had that overtime and we we're disinfecting the buses as well. You know, we purchased hand sanitizer and a number of other things. So. There's about 66K that we had, you know, hard invoices for bills that we've actually paid. And we've had encumbered for, you know, there's other items out there that are encumbered for, such as those 50 laptops that we purchased. We haven't paid for those yet, um, but that will be, you know, another piece of that submission. Um, then, you know, and then um, for special ed, there's some Lexia licenses. Uh, that's a technology item that we'll um, need to include. We haven't paid that invoice yet because we just started doing these purchase orders. You know, we started the purchase orders late May, June, as we learned about, oh, we might need this. We'll probably need that. So, um, you know, once those sales actually consummate, we get the invoice and then we get the, 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 um, the, we pay it and we get a check number, then we can um, put those in additional submissions. So I just kind of say that because you, you, you want to th start thinking about the numbers in your head here, right? 66,000 of things that, uh, those just uh, smaller things that we've actually had to do. Um, and then we have 50 laptops that are sort of coming. And then I also um, just recently signed a PPE purchase order for some $200,000 worth of PPE that will be necessary to get us ready for, um, you know, for, for September and, you know, there's still more PPE stuff that we have to um, have to purchase. So, you know, you're, you're, you're getting up to, you know, seven, $800,000 now. And, you know, there, there's, there's more to come. So, um, but that's it. So it, that's, that's how it works. And, um, you know, we will submit for the reimbursements and um, I don't know that you want me to go over the three schedules. Right, it was just the three sheets that's in your packet. Um, I could I could sh show them just briefly on the screen if you'd like. Um, yeah, why don't you put them up? Okay. So let's do that. So so here it is. I mean, this was the you know the the, the overall packet. I mean, it was like eighty pages um, on the document. Um, mm -hmm. 
the uh, you know, and so it, um, and I just took the first piece of this, okay, just like the, um, so you could see the submission deadlines and stuff. So we have a submission deadline of, you know, of, of July 10th and the anticipated process and things. So that's when we'd actually physically get the reimbursement, presumably. And we don't know exactly, how, you know, how, how good the schedule is yet, because we mm -hmm. don't have experience as a town yet. So that gives you an idea. So I, I presume that for 2021, a similar schedule will come out and they'll have the, the times when you can kind of uh, apply for the money. And at that point, anything that we've taken in that we've actually been able to pay for, which when we pay for it, we'll pay for it out of the school funds. And, and we're okay with that because, you know, we have um, line item autonomy. So it's our entire 56 or $58 million budget. So we can cover these expenditures, but then we want to get that money back in and sort of credit the, the, the COVID buckets that we actually use so that it doesn't really um, take away from our overall budgeting money. Okay. Great. And then, um, you know, there's the application uh, request. So, you know, that's it. I, I, I took a, you know, submit for reimbursement. So there's a process to it. The download, the request form is just a spreadsheet schedule. Um, mm -hmm. And it's blank and, and it basically says, what's the item that you purchased? You know, what was the purchase date? When was it paid? What's the check number? Um, you know, and a description. So that's- um, That's great. No, thank you, John. Time. Okay, I'll stop uh -oh. sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Is anyone on the committee, uh, Michelle? Sorry, yeah, John, I'm sorry. Can you just clarify? So the funds that we, the school department, is going to submit for reimbursement, are those, like, is that definitively coming to the school department or does it all go to the town and then they decide? I'm just curious about the funds flow. Well, I think the way the funds will flow, Michelle, and of course it, we, you know, I mean, this would be based on, you know, my experience for the most part, right? So uh, the, the, mo the, the most sane way to make it flow is we submit together, the money comes in and then I ask Sue, hey, make a journal entry to these accounts so you credit these accounts for me because I'm going to expend out of the school budget. So as, as we go forward, you're going to see all this extra million dollars be spent out of the school budget. But as we get the reimbursements, it'll come in, it might be similar to, like, to the insurance type things. You know, like, you know how if we have an insurance claim over $150,000, the town, the money comes in, it goes into a specific account that's insurance over 150,000. And then we have to ask the, the, ta the, the voters, the taxpayers to move it back to the school budget. I don't think that this is not gonna require a vote to come back, but when they get the money, then Sue and I will just talk and say, okay, so, hey, here, hit these accounts for me. Because I've set up several accounts, um, one for maintenance for all the PPE, and Joe has one for technology. And um, then we have one set up for transportation and, you know, one set up for some special education stuff. So we'll see the invoices that we actually submitted and what their components are. And then when it says, okay, here's a, here's a million dollars, then I'll say, hey, so, um, we got 800,000 of that million dollars. Can you credit this account for 500,000 for me? Credit this one for 200. And she'll do that journal entry. So it'll make our budget whole again. It'll basically take the expense away. So, right. so you don't think there's a risk that the total town's COVID related expenses are more than what we get the town gets reimbursed for, including what the school needs. Oh, I'm not saying that. No, I, I didn't okay. say that. No, I, I said how I think the money will flow. I don't know. I don't know. That's why we're on austerity measures. Right. Okay, because it, it, the austerity measures, I don't, I wish I could say, yeah, a million and a half is going to happen. I, you know, the, 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 the more I see expenses, the more I see like, you know, what would we have to do to do this? You know, are we going to need extra long-term subs because the class size is going to be too big or we can't separate them. So we're going to need some of those, you know, are we, you know, Patrick and I were talking about transportation. It's like, okay, so if we, we, we certainly are not going to get 25 new buses because we can't, but how are we going to do with the special ed stuff? Is it going to be outsourced? I mean, because I can't put eight kids in a van. I can't put them in that little van, you know, I'm going to have to separate mm -hmm. them. So, you know, we, we look, it's like, hey, hey, how much, how much are new, uh, you know, six new vans if we had to purchase them? When could they get in here? You know, 
looked at me like 258,000. I said, okay, what's the cost of outsourcing that? And can we get an outsourced person? So we're looking at all of these things, but literally every time we look at anything, there's going to be a cost to it. I just told you what cost that I know right now, yeah. you know, but the whole plan isn't together yet. So, so I wish, I would love to say, I think it will do it, but I think the austerity measures that were taken are like, you know, with the zero spend start for the most part, it's like, we're going to spend all our budget money. We just not, may not spend it the way we've got it planned right now. Mm -hmm. right. Liza? Or, or... Um, but Michelle, I would say in that financial plan that we agreed to with the town, um, that originally it only had itemizing reimbursable COVID-19 expenses. And then we added in, we would identify all COVID-19 expenses for just this reason that if they, you know, if we exceed what's reimbursable, the town needs to understand that, yeah, we have more expenses than that and we can itemize them. And hopefully either we do the austerity measures or reserve fund can cover it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the reality of, yeah, I mean, we've got to work it through. Ness, did you have make a some tough choices? Yeah. Yeah. So, John, did we, were there invoices that were sent during FY20 from the whole town? I thought we had some school related expenses that we had submitted invoices for FY20. Um, we had started talking about it a while back, maybe right. May time frame. And I'm wondering how that flowed through and whether we got that money back. Yeah, no, no. So those, that's, that's just, that's gone in this year's budget. That's gone in the 20 budget because the, we, we, we didn't, you know, that's the $66,000 that I'm telling you about. We, we just got, you know, it takes a, you know, it, it, but, but by the time you, you, you do an order, you get the stuff in and you make a payment and you get the check number. That's a two or three month process sometimes. So, okay, so it's actually in FY21 and not in 20. Nope, it's, go, it's going to be submitted in FY20 and it will come back to the town and it'll go into the town general fund. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, but, but then you look at it too, that, you know, from the town general fund, there's $3.5 million of FY21 money coming out of the town general fund. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's a small, small portion of uh, the money. And it's just because of the cycle. By the time we get the checks, you know, if you get one check, it's like, mm, you're not going to submit for like $1,000. It's just too much work to, oh, here's a $2,000 invoice. You know, you'd rather big, you know, make bigger submissions because um, it's all a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know, in manpower and labor. And, you know, we've been doing everything we can based on, you know, the, the half remote, half in the office just to get the bills closed and bills paid and, you know, get everything closed out, you know, uh, along with all the endless meetings and the phone calls and the trying to planning and stuff. You know, people are, they, they're stretched, you know, um, so. We're doing the best we can. It is you, so you don't want to take like, you know, oh, three hours. Hey, let me put in for this $5,000, you know? It's like you, we, we have to make it, um, you know, a bigger chunk and, and make it worthwhile. So it is, it is a lot of work. Yeah, no, thank you, John. Um, does anyone else on the committee have questions? Anyone in the, um, on the audience have questions? If you could raise your hands. Okay, well, thank you again, John. This is this is very helpful, um, and thank you for all your work. And we hear you <laughs> that you're all stretched very thin, so we appreciate all. The work yeah, it's more like I'm. I want you to know the dollars. You know, the dollars yeah. are adding up. That's the important thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so the next one is seven point four to discuss the bids work received for the network switches and act as appropriate. This is you too. <laughs> so. Um, actually, I can start that in your okay. packet uh, with a letter dated July 7th. Um, you will see a, a letter from John Ferris to me uh, outlining the process for the bids. Uh, it should be item 7.4 in your, in your packet, um, indicating that the district recently opened bids for the purchase of nine network switches to be placed in the four Hingham Elementary Schools. Um, long and short of this, we had... Um, we had 50 some odd requests for the bid specs and ultimately received seven sealed bids uh, for the project. 
The lowest bidder, bidder was actually um, a Newburyport, Massachusetts company with a bid of 160214 However, um, John notes here that upon review of the bid, uh, the quote stated that the uh, switches would be new or reconditioned, um, which caused pause for the committee. Um, they then began to look at their second lowest bidder, um, which is a company, company called Integration Partners Corporation uh, from Lexington, Mass, with a bid of 170,052.59. And although it was $10,000 higher, uh, the vendor's quote uh, was for all new equipment. Um, and, and so they've, and Hingham Public Schools has used integration partners before, most recently for the new switching equipment installed at the high school last year. Um, and uh, I know Mr. Ferris and, and his team uh, did their background reference checks. All that looked good. Um, so it was the recommendation of Mr. Ferris uh, to recommend the award, the, the nine network switch bid to integration partners uh, at the quoted price of $170,052.59. And the vendor will secure the additional subsidized funding reimbursement directly via the E-rate program. Do you want to add anything? So that's the recommendation that was given to me. I, I agree with John and make that to the committee. John, is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, no, the only thing, so you should also note that the um, on cue, the um, lowest bidder is not, was not happy and went to the IG's office um, for you know, some type of bid protest. I had also called the IG's office to make sure that, uh, you know, it was sort of like they, they, they added a condition to their response where it would be new and if we couldn't get renewed, it would be reconditioned or remanufactured. And it's like, you know, once they put that in a bid, you can't accept it. It's like not, not um, you know, it, it, they, they weren't responsive to what we were saying we wanted. You know, we wanted these switches. You can't, I, if I wanted reconditioned switches, I would have asked for it. So anyways, I uh, have not heard anything from the IG's office, although the vendor did say he was putting a bid protest in with the IG's office, but I have not heard anything. Um, and I am recommending that we just go with integration partners, um, as, you know, with the second lowest bid of 170.052.59. Okay, does anyone on the committee have any questions about this? I have one question. John, what was the budget on this? Um, the budget was in that um, vicinity, Liza. This was the, so this is the, um, the, of the technology, we have the regular recurrent technology. This was the infrastructure piece. And I believe it was like 190. So okay. we're in, a, we're in, the, we're yeah. in the range of that original budget. And then that's based on an E-rate. So they, the vendor will actually apply for like 40% reimbursement on some of that. So the overall cost of the job is probably more like 250, but the E-rate subsidizes by 40%. Thank you. Okay, so I will take a motion. Um, Liza, do you have that in front of you? I don't have the dollar amount. Um, or anybody else? Yeah. It's 100, Carlos, it's $170,052.59. Okay. And the company is Integration Partners Corporation. Someone else would like to make a motion? Go ahead, please. Do that. Uh, I'll make a motion to award the nine network switch bid to Integration Partners at the quoted price of $170,052.59. I'll second that. Okay, and roll call vote. Jen Benham? Aye. Uh, Libby Lewicki? Aye. Ness Carenti? Aye. Um, Michelle Ayer? Aye. Liza? Aye. Uh, Carlos? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. Okay, next to discuss the parameters to guide the development of a calendar of a 2020-2021 school committee meeting dates for presentation at the July 27, 2020 meeting. Um, so we normally meet the first and roughly the first and third Monday of each month at 7 p.m. Um, are there any anyone who feels strongly about changing that? No. Okay. So I think we can just go with that um, going forward. So we'll we'll take a look and see where they fall, and if we need to move them around, we can talk about that at the next meeting. But. 
Okay, next one is to discuss the appointment of a member of the school committee to the foster school building committee and act as appropriate. Um, Michelle had reached out to, and expressed interest in doing this, um, but I don't know if anyone else was, was interested. We, if, if you are, we can talk about it. Is anyone? No? So, um, okay, would someone like to make a motion? I'll make the motion to appoint uh, Michelle Ayer as the school committee representative to the Foster School Building Committee. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, thanks, Miss. All right, roll call vote. Uh, Jen Benham? Aye. Libby? Aye. Ness? Aye. Um, do you, Michelle? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and Liza? Hi. Um, I'd just like to add, I think it's great Michelle wants to do this and that she's now on the committee for three years, which hopefully will take us into the project launching. So the continuity should be very um, helpful for us. So Definitely. Thank you, no, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Hi, Carla? Hi. And I, I as well. Thank you very much, Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That's great. Excellent. Uh, Okay, next one is 7.7 .7, to consider the homeschool application of Jeffrey Robert Breen, grade one for fiscal year 21 and act as appropriate. And Dr. Austin, I believe you reviewed the plan. I have reviewed the plan and I uh, endorse the application for your approval. Okay, would someone like to make a motion? I'll make the motion. Uh, and I do apologize, I was having a little technical difficulty here. And to follow me on my phone and the computer open. I move that we approve the home education application of uh, Jeffrey Robert Bring. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, roll call. So, uh, Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Libby? Aye. Jill? Aye. Liza? Aye. Carlos? I and I'm an I too, so it's approved. Okay, um, 7.8 and 7.9 and uh, 7.10 are a list of people. Oh, so 7.8 is the, the advancement on the salary scale. Um, 7.9 is to receive notification of appointments, and 7.10 is to receive a notification of full year leaves of absences um, of a number of teachers and staff members. So thank you. Uh, number eight is other items as may not reasonably known within 48 hours of the meeting. Does anyone have anything? Carrie, sorry, I, I don't have a 48 hours item, but I realized that my mistake on this one thing that I thought of that you just might want to remind the committee members of is committee assignments. So I was going to bring that up. Not on the agenda, but I'm <laughs> Throw it out there under 48. <laughs> yeah. No, I know we, we need to um, reshuffle the um, subcommittees and then the liaisons to the different schools and organizations in town. So I will send, I will email around um, just a list of everyone, of all of the organizations and subcommittees. And if you could just send me your um, preferences by, let's say, next Thursday, um, I think it's the 16th. Um, that would, I, I'll put it in the email, but that would be helpful. And, um, and so we can get going on that. So, and we can talk about, we can do the appointments at the next meeting. Um, the next, okay, so next is number nine, adjourn to executive session. Um, would somebody like to make a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn to executive session, not to return to open session, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, conduct, uh, or discuss strategy for collective bargaining sessions and uh, contract negotiations with non-union personnel, the public discussion of which will be detrimental to the committee's bargaining position and to conduct a unit A grievance hearing. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Michelle. All right, roll call, Jen? Aye. Libby? Aye. Ness? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Liza? Aye. Carlos? Aye. And I am an I as well. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for everyone who hung in right there for the meeting.